that guest experience is truly the reason why we get up every morning, uh, creating a really safe and amazing guest experience because we don't know, you know, we have obviously, we had a lot of, obviously a lot of season pass holders and people do, they would do frequent visits at the park, but you know, there were a lot of people who were coming and that was their vacation for the year. That was their reunion. Welcome to the Attraction Pros Podcast, where we discuss the latest trends and challenges facing the attractions industry today. We chat with some of the top leaders in the field and provide resources that will help develop your career in this great industry. I am Josh Liebman. I am obsessed with the guest experience and helping attractions make that their top priority for success. And I'm Matt Heller. I am passionate about organizational effectiveness, leadership development, and employee engagement. Now sit upright, hold on tight, and get ready for the Attraction Pros Podcast. Hey, Matt, how's it going? It's going great. Good, glad to hear that. And... And what else? I'm feeling fantastic today. Whew, we almost had an incomplete episode. (laughs) (laughs) Matt, question for you. Yes, sir. One thing I know about you... Uh-oh. Is you like roller coasters? I do. Do you remember the moment you realized you liked roller coasters? I remember it vividly. Go on. Well, I think I've told this story. I know I've told the story to you. Um, I may have told it on the podcast before. My very first roller coaster was a scorpion at Bush Gardens in Florida. I got in line. I was 16 years old. I was deathly afraid of roller coasters up to that point. I got in line because the girl I was seeing at the time said, come on, get in line, wait in line with me. And I said, all right, trying to be a good boyfriend. I get in line. I get up to the front. There's no chicken exit. There's no place for me to go. White knuckle all the way up that chain lift, right? As soon as we crested the, the very top of the hill, and you know how the, the hill kind of curves this way. Mm-hmm. As soon as we started to descend, I was hooked. That's, That's that awesome. was that was the moment, the moment. What about you? Do you remember? Yeah, I do. Uh, it was. I can tell you the date. It was June twenty first, nineteen ninety nine. Okay. I don't know why I remember that. I just remember dates. <laughs> and I was on a trip to Cedar Point with a youth group, and I I had been a couple times before, and I had I had ridden. I had ridden Junior Gemini, I had ridden Gemini on, on some previous visits when I was like seven, eight years old. So I, I had ridden a couple of small roller, and Gemini, which is not a small roller coaster, but I, I was still scared, right? And I just remember being on the bus on the way to the park thinking, something's going to change today. And I spent the day working up courage and, and really like learned, learned my way around and mapped it out and kind of like, you know... Did, did uh, Woodstock Express, I, I don't think Woodstock was, eh, it was open. I had Cedar Creek Mine Ride, Iron Dragon, like, okay, con- like constantly like working my way up. And I was really trying to get up to ride Corkscrew because I had never been on a roller coaster that went upside down before. And, uh, and I had a friend with me, actually it was a friend I made on the bus who we realized we were like uh, equal, I, I don't know, proficiency or like challenging with roller coasters. So it was like, it was like an accountability partner. And, uh, and yeah, I remember going through that first loop being like, I'm doing it and it's not so bad. And I just remember getting off and thinking, I did it, it's done. And now what am I going to do? So I, I ended up, you know, later that day going on Raptor. I went by myself, my, my friend that we split up, he went on Mantis. He told me later on the bus back and I just knew that something had changed. And now I had this connection with obviously the industry that I fell in love with. I think you also just may have created a business or some sort of entity being the, being a roller coaster accountability partner. Ooh, there's something there. I don't know what it is, but I wrote that down. There's something there. Stay tuned everybody to, to hear more about that. (laughs) Whenever we come up with something, we'll put it out on Twitter. See what. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So great story. Why are we talking about that? Thank you. So our guest today is Ron McKenzie. Uh, most recently, Ron was park president of Six Flags Over Texas uh, between Dallas, Fort Worth in Arlington, Texas. And we get to hear all about theme park stories. We get to, to hear about nostalgia. 
We get to hear many amazing leadership lessons. He has phenomenal advice for young professionals and aspiring leaders in the industry. And uh, there are a number of stories and examples that, that he shares of the connection that people have with the industry. Uh, he talks about a family reunion at Six Flags Over Texas uh, shortly after they had reopened from, from their initial lockdown from COVID and just how meaningful it was for all those guests. Uh, and he also shares the story of his first roller coaster and, and what got him hooked as well. So that's just what reminded me of that. Yeah, absolutely. And he also talks about his kids who worked at Six Flags St. Louis when he was there. Um, this episode for me is really, really cool because I think in, in some ways, maybe all three of our careers mirror each other. Um, you know, we got the bug and we pursued things and it wasn't really necessarily what we thought we were going to do. Um, but for me, you know, a lot of the interviews that we've done are people are with people that we don't necessarily know or know very well, right? Until we get to do the interview. And it's wonderful to meet them and 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 learn about them. And I think what's kind of neat about Ron is that this is sort of to me, sort of the nostalgic. Uh, version of some of the interviews that we do. Just like our our um, our industry, there's some things that are brand new and shiny and great and things that we don't know much about. And then there's that warm blanket of comfort that you get when you when you experience that that roller coaster that you've done a million times and you get to do it and you know every turn and you know every every place to lean. And you know, Ron being sort of a sort of a, a like-minded individual, I think, to the two of us and many people in the industry, it was just that that wonderful feeling of talking to literally an old friend, but also somebody who shares our passion for the industry. So this interview is going to be like eating a hot bowl of soup on a cold winter day. <laughs> Something like that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> a warm, fuzzy feeling. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, I just realized something too is another commonality that you and Ron have is both of your first roller coasters were designed by Anton Schwarzkopf. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> and, and there was a girl involved. That's true. That's true. Yes. <laughs> as you will hear as Ron talks about his uh, experience in the interview. All right. So put on some fuzzy socks and turn on the fireplace because let's get to this warm, fuzzy, warm blanket interview with Ron McKenzie. <laughs> Ron McKenzie, welcome to the Attraction Pros podcast. How are you doing today, Ron? I'm doing fabulous. It's sunny and warm here in North Texas. So based on the week we had last week when it was in the teens, I am thrilled with the weather. Can't <laughs> complain. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Ron, uh, so excited to have you on the show. You and I have known each other for many years and uh, can't wait to hear some more of your wisdom and get that out to everybody. So first of all, can you tell us a little bit about your career in the attractions industry? Sure. You know, I, uh, I, you know, little, born and raised Texan, uh, born and raised in San Antonio, never thought I would ever leave uh, Texas. Uh, and I found my way back. But when my wife and I were dating, we were in uh, downtown San Antonio, where you got the infamous corn in the cup, which I think we'll talk about <laughs> later. Uh, and there was this little thing called the SeaWorld of Texas Preview Center. And we were very curious about this new project that was happening in San Antonio. So we wandered in there. And we wandered out with Founders Day passes for SeaWorld of Texas. Uh, and I think from then on, about every date that we had, uh, we spent out there. I, you know, we even cut some classes in college uh, to go watch Shamu somewhere around. So I had this epiphany late in my you know, academic career that if I didn't get a job working for an ad agency in some you know, fabulous New York shop or Chicago shop, that doing marketing in a theme park uh, or you know, a sports type of organization would be a, a cool, fun job for a marketing hack as well. So I got the job with the agency, did it for two years, loved it. Uh, but there was this little project getting ready to open up in Northwest San Antonio. I got to know them and applied for a job as a group sales rep um, for Fiesta Texas and started there in 93, the second year the park opened. Uh, I was handed a phone book and said, there's Austin, go sell something. I said, I don't even know what I'm selling, but okay. And um, I love the the autonomy. I love um, I love what I sold. You know, I'd very often be in lobbies or you know waiting rooms with people that were selling copy machines or selling paper or whatever. And I was walking in selling fun uh, with a brand new project. So uh, the industry bug bit me pretty quickly, and I you know I loved it ever since. Uh, I 
stayed with Fiesta Texas through the Six Flags acquiring them in 1996, and then kind of began my journey around the Midwest. So I moved from there to St. Louis to be the group sales manager in 99, promoted to director of marketing at Astroworld in 04, and thought we had gotten back to Texas for good. And lo and behold, in 2005, unfortunately, Astroworld closed. And so they shipped me back off to St. Louis, where I spent 10 years of director of marketing before landing back at Texas, at Fiesta Texas, and then eventually uh, in Arlington here uh, as the former park president at Six Flags Over Texas and Hurricane Arbor Arlington. So all that to say that it's been a, an amazing 26 plus years of theme park love and spirit and camaraderie and thrills and adventure. And uh, I wouldn't trade or exchange a single moment of it for anything. Excellent. Uh, I was trying to follow along and kind of connect the dots from San Antonio, yeah. St. Louis, Houston, and then uh, and then eventually to Dallas. Yeah. Uh, you talk a little bit about um, when you were working at Fiesta Texas and in sales, and you said you're you're competing with those people or, or sitting in the same office as someone you know in there also selling copy machines, and you're in there selling fun. I uh, what was. What, was it also a challenge, though, for people to say yes and, and to be able to, I would say, make those sales from, you know, kind of from group sales at perhaps a, you know, a, a new theme park that was still, I would say, building its brand, building its momentum. And I would say kind of what were some of the challenges in those early days? Well, you know, just like when my wife and I wandered into that SeaWorld preview center, it's like, what, what are they building the SeaWorld in, in central, South Te central Texas? What's this is about and what does this project mean? Uh, there was a lot of curiosity about Fiesta Texas uh, when it first opened because, as you guys may or may not recall, it was actually built as an entertainment show park. So it was really candidly all about the shows and the entertainment. And I remember the first time I went there, there was one roller coaster. And so um, kind of educating people and getting them excited about what the project was, while it was a challenge, I think people were very curious about what it was and what it was going to be. And I think, you know, when you're in the group sales world in the theme park business, these, these planners, they don't have a lot of time. So anything you can do to educate them and give them easy access to new experiences and opportunities so they don't have to go through the, well, the phone book at that time, not so much anymore. But even today, I think um, the, the more that we could show them just what a unique and different experience doing a, a group event at a theme park really is. And the fact that they don't really have to do a lot of the work they would have to do planning a traditional company outing or, or organizational outing, uh, that made it a little easier. But uh, you know, it wasn't hard getting appointments, candidly, just because people were so dang curious about that project and what it meant. Yeah, Ron, I'm curious too a little bit about some of your trajectories around the around the, the industry. And um, I think what has piqued my curiosity is maybe the differences of being in, in different locations, right? You know, you've got, you've got uh, St. Louis, you've got a couple of different places in Texas. How did the regionality of that impact what you did? It, it, it is amazing. And I had the good fortune of working at two of the, two of the three legacy Six Flags Park and, and obviously Arlington and in St. Louis. And, and even though, you know, brands like Six Flags or SeaWorld or even some of the Cedar Parks, you know, even though there's this national brand, every park really is very local. I always to say to people, our business is local. We're a national brand with a local focus. And you know, if you talk to people, for example, in St. Louis and anywhere you went, you mentioned that you worked at Six Flags, they could tell you a story of something that occurred that still is in their memory bank from visiting the park. You know, whether it was their first job, they met their wife there, they had their first kiss there, they saw their first concert. And that was fairly universal from market to market. Um, not so much in the early days with Fiesta Texas, obviously, because it was relatively new, but especially in markets like Houston and in St. Louis, where the parks were really anchored in those markets and had been around for a long time. Um, you know, those, those milestones, those first coasters, those first rides, I'm sure Matt and, and Josh, you can tell me about, you know, the first coaster you rode and, and where that was and how that sort of created your excitement and enthusiasm and love for the industry. Well, so imagine that in each of these local markets, everybody ha has their stories about their own personal experience uh, with the park. So figuring out how to tap into that, you know, my kids, all three of them had their first jobs at Six Flags St. Louis. So I'm sure as they travel the globe in their careers and, and things that they do, they'll talk about that. And that was, that was their park. St. Louis was their park. Yeah. 
I'm curious then to bridge that everything you were just talking of, of the importance of creating those memories. You mentioned, you know, people remember their, you know, their first roller coaster, their first date with someone, kind of really the, the impact that, uh, that the park has on their lives. Then tying that in with your leadership strategy, as far as uh, being the park president at Six Flags Over Texas and making sure that that message doesn't get lost kind of in the in the weeds or of kind of the the nitty gritty of all right, what needs to be done to get open today and making sure that that is top of mind or at least somewhere in mind kind of when uh, doing what we do to serve those guests on a daily basis. I, I would say in, in two folds, that's a really terrific question because, you know, we do, especially the, the further up we get in leadership and, and management roles, we do have a tendency to take our eye off that because we're so focused in the day-to-day -day minutia of operating a business. There are lots of things con to consider, staffing, budgets, you know, financials, expenditures, uh, weather. Um, but what I used to tell the team, and really anywhere that I've been, that guest experience is truly the reason why we get up every morning, uh, creating a really safe and amazing guest experience because we don't know, you know, we have obviously, we had a lot of, obviously a lot of season pass holders and people do, they would do frequent visits at the park, but you know, there were a lot of people who were coming and that was their vacation for the year. That was their reunion. I, I there's a great story um, right out of the pandemic, especially here in Arlington, when things really started to open up. Um, I was standing at the front gate at park closed, just saying goodbye to guests. And I, I heard a lot of screaming and a lot of, you know, loud yelps and, and tears. And I, I walked over and asked this guest if they were okay. And it was a family reunion. And it was the first time they had the opportunity to hug each other and, and, you know, and, and love on each other. Uh, and that was like, we, we were, the, we, we were what they chose. We were the experience. We were the venue that they chose to be able to hug each other for the first time in two years. So those are the stories I try to keep telling the, you know, the team is we need to remember those things. You know, it, it, the business is stressful at times and operating a food park can be very complicated. And there are lots of dynamics that you, you don't think about or consider going into the day that pop up. But ultimately it is about delivering that amazing guest experience and, and being mindful that it is an awesome responsibility to deliver those experiences every day for our guests, even though on July 13th and 103 degree heat, you know, you're like, oh my gosh, I just need to survive the day. There's a family there having their vacation there that day that are going to create memories and experiences that they'll talk about around the dinner table. And we need to be really mindful of that every day. And I'll take that even a step further and talk about developing team members and developing staff and the awesome responsibility it is for us to, to develop these young men and women, especially today uh, in a difficult staffing environment. It's more than just the weekly paycheck that we need to talk about. We need to talk about how we develop them and how we give them the skills that they need to be successful in the, you know, in the working environment that they're going to be in as they get older and advance in their lives and in their careers. So Ron, I'm glad you brought up team members because I had a conversation just the other day and would love to get your perspective on it. And it's sort of the balance of, you know, when you see someone that has potential but doesn't necessarily believe or have the confidence in their own potential, like the balance of you as an executive or you as their leader to, you know, push them because you see it in them, but not to push them too far, too fast, because that's going to, that's going to, you know, be worse in the long run. So how do you sort of balance that sort of leadership and, and pushing people at, at the right time in the right way? I think it's about understanding what they want and what they get excited about. Uh, and, and knowing that, so asking really early on the right questions, what, what do you want to do? Like, where do you want to go with this? Do you see this as a career path for you outside of when you get out of high school and we are, or is this just something you're doing to be able to, you know, put gas in your car and, and, you know, take a girl out or a guy out to the movies. So one of the things I love to do, and, and this was, it, it sort of happened organically. I'd love to tell you that I thought about it, but uh, you know, we were so busy during uh, the early days of reopening after the pandemic, it was really hard to even find time to go grab a bite or, you know, take a break. So I, the, the employee cafeteria was uh, centrally located in the park. So I would always stop by there and just sit down and sit outside uh, and get some fresh air. And I, it, it became one of these things where team members would sit and they would come talk to me and they would come talk to me about the business, what they loved about their job. And I realized this is a really good way to learn about what our team members experience 
is like and what they need and what they want. And before too long, it's like I could barely get my food in because I had so many team members stopping and talking to me. But I also think just being available and being consistent in how you communicate and the direction and holding them accountable and helping them understand uh, you know, what it is their goal and focus should be. It's really candidly leadership is just all about effective communication and, and, and trust and getting people to believe in what you're trying to accomplish and then giving them the tools to do that. So, but I love that part of the job. I think, you know, that became my favorite time in the park was just having that opportunity to sit down and talk with team members because we give the kids today a bad rap. You know, they, they don't get a lot of credit for being, but there are a lot of really hardworking, smart, intelligent young men and women who are working in our industry that we need to just make sure we continue to develop and give them the tools and resources to be successful. The ability to have this type of relationship and I would say engagement and communication with staff members across all departments, across you know all, all levels of the organization structure, does that become more difficult, I would say, kind of going up the ranks and particularly being park president, uh, you kind of share the importance of, of really, I interpret this as going an inch wide and a mile deep, but at the same time, wanting to be able to do this at scale with thousands of employees that are working for the property. So I would say kind of balancing that and, and making sure that you're able to give that time and give that focus as, as equally distributed as possible. Yeah, you have to be very intentional and you have to you have to make it a priority. It's easy. I look I, on an operating day. I could sit at my desk for eight hours and watch the numbers coming in on the computer and watch the videos while working through another you know, litany of Excel files for presentations or PowerPoints. But you have to you have to be intentional about how you do it and when you do it. And I think it's important too to develop that trust. You have to be consistent about it to do it every once in a while and not and not be available on a consistent basis. Um, but it is, it, you're right, Josh, it, it's, you could easily get caught up in a minutia of just what you have to do every day to operate. So that's why I love the weekends, uh, because the weekends, there were less requirements of my time administratively, and I could really dedicate my time to being in the park, you know, interacting with guests, talking with guests, and also interacting with team members. So, uh, so it's just about being intentional and making sure that it's a priority in how you manage your time and how you manage the responsibilities and the days that you have. So Ron, first of all, I wanna have lunch with Ron. I think that'd be <laughs> super fun. <laughs> um, um, but also I, I totally agree with you that, you know, young people in the industry, when you blanket them, a lot of times we, you know, they do get a bad rap, right? Totally. Um, can you remember any specific stories or uh, accounts of some of those interactions that you had with people that just kind of said, wow, this person is gonna, they're going to knock it out of the park. There is, there is, uh, there is current. Well, I, there's a lot of them, um, a lot of many different experiences. Uh, but there is a young man in Six Flags over Texas that's currently designing his own theme park, uh, and he would come and find me about once every three or four weeks and show me his design on on whatever platform he was using, and he plans on building it. And I believe him. I think he's going to do it. And I want to go to this theme park because it's every cool ride that you would have ever imagined to be all collected and, and, and put into one park. But, you know, he, he, he believes that he can do it. He wants to do it. And he loves and has the passion for the business. So every once in a while, he works in our rides department, or he worked in our rides department, still does work in our rides department. Um, and he would come find me and he'd say, hey, do you have 30 minutes? I'd love to show you my you know, the latest addition to the theme park I'm going to build. And I go, I want to be there opening day, buddy. You tell me, you tell me when it's going to happen and I'll make sure that I'm there. So um, that's just one example. And it's sort of symbolic of a lot of the, 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 the team members that have ideas and thoughts. And then many of them would come to me and say, Hey, I think it'd be really interesting if we did this, or do you know, we have an issue here. And it's things that I don't necessarily hear if I'm not you know, actively listening and talking to them. So, but that's that I can't wait to see this young man's uh, theme park when he finally gets it built. We'll all be working for him, Matt. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, no, I, I think that's really interesting as far as kind of giving that uh, undivided attention to someone who, in, in this particular instance, wasn't a, a specific business need. In fact, it, don't, could, could have been considered competitive. You know, going to build yeah. it in Arlington, right next door. Yeah. To all, all that, and uh, and being able to manage that time and to make some some great points with that. 
You talk also about the relationship with the community, and we tied into that kind of a, a couple of minutes ago. Uh, and we talk about that, that um, I would say the tie to legacy. You talk about uh, Six Flags over Texas, Six Flags St. Louis kind of being those original, original parks. I'm curious as far as then balancing that with also pushing the parks into the future as well, while also preserving that legacy, that nostalgia that we talked about, but also at the same time, making sure we are serving the next generation that, uh, that the parks are moving into. Yeah, you know, and that's at the legacy parks, especially, it's, it's really easy to fall into the trap of, well, that's always been there, so we should keep it. And I think you really do have to ask yourself candidly, is that still bringing value to the guest experience? And if it is, then by all means, we should continue to keep keep that there or keep that ride there or that area there or that themed, themed attraction. But it also comes down to the fact that we still need to continue to innovate and grow and add new attractions because the new innovative attractions we're putting in today are gonna be these guests' legacies 20, 30 years from now. So you have to be mindful of that. So it is a balance and it's not it's not a black or white question you really do have to just evaluate and think about what you know what value that particular uh, legacy attraction or historical attraction brings to the overall guest experience and keeping it just for the sake of keeping it is is not the right decision you just have to really be thoughtful about that strategy and balanced about what you do and and you know you pay homage to the history especially at legacy parks uh, like in over texas or or st louis that have been around you know arlington celebrated 60 this past year, St. Louis celebrated 50. So it's ironic that they're exactly 10 years apart, but there's a lot of those kinds of attractions there that were there when the parks opened or shortly thereafter that people are very fond of, or it is their, it is their experience when they go to the park and they want to bring their kids and grandkids to experience what they experienced as a kid, but it may not bring as much value to the park experience as it once did. So those are very difficult and hard conversations sometimes. And kind of speaking to that, you got to work at Astro World, which mm-hmm. you know, from, a, from a historian standpoint, you're, you know, someone like me who loves the industry and would love to go to any park that is now closed, right? You know, just to, for that opportunity. Yeah. What was it like um, to uh, work there? What was that? Well, I, I'll, I'll even go back further. Um, you know, growing up in San Antonio, we didn't have a theme park. We had a little Playland Park. Um that you know was fun, but it, it certainly didn't have the rides experience. So I grew up going to Astroworld. Astroworld was the place we went on school field trips, band trips, you know, um, baseball team trips, things of that nature. So for me, it was a very personal thing to be able to go back and work there. My big joke is uh, I was absolutely scared of roller coasters till I rode Grease Lightning, the Schwarzkopf shuttle. Uh, and the only reason why I got in line was I was trying to get a girl's phone number. And uh, <laughs> I ended up not getting the number, but I ended up writing the ride. And I went, wow, this is really fun. I can't believe what I've been missing out on. So um, so th- to have the opportunity to go back and ride that ride and as the marketing director there, um, it was it was incredible. It was a neat little park. Um, so many great rides. Texas Cyclone, which uh, sadly or, or, or you know, honorably, I had the opportunity to be on the last train out. Uh, the night the park closed. It was um, it was a great park. I had a lot of charm, uh, had a lot of great rides, uh, just like all the parks I've worked at. Um, some really terrific people that just love the park. It was their passion. Uh, so it was, uh, it was a great place to be. I'm, I'm sorry that it was short, so short-lived, um, but I'm honored and, and to have had the opportunity to have worked there, especially the last two years. What was the... Uh... I guess the energy or the emotions like uh, when the park was closing with all the people who had, who had just spent so much time and so much commitment. Can you share a little bit of, of just what it felt like? I will, I will tell you this, um, you know, I was really proud of the way we, we delivered the closing of the park because we all love the park so much that we wanted to, to make sure that the way we said goodbye um, was appropriate for what the park meant to us. Um, so, you know, we had about a month or so to operate the park after it was announced uh, to close. And um, so we, we wanted to make sure that everything we did from that point forward paid tribute and honor to the legacy that that park had in the community and to all the people who, who have worked there. There's still a lot of us former Astroworldians who get together and talk, talk about the park. But I, I will tell you, it, it was a little surreal. We, we closed 
Um, that night we said good night and you know hugged our guests. We had a lot of very special guests here that, that night. A lot of Acers were there because they love the park. Um, and we, we we all went over to Cyclone. We uh, we rode Cyclone. We took the last the last ride out, uh, and then we went to the picnic area. And we we all just stood around because none of us wanted to leave. Um, <laughs> and we were like, what do, what do we do now? You know, there's no and, and hearing a park being called 10-7 on the radio for the last time ever uh, was. I mean, it, it brings makes me a little weepy just to think about that night. I finally made it out to my car around 3 a.m. I think. Uh, because again, none of us wanted to leave. We knew for many of us, I was already working back at, at St. Louis um, already. And I was, I was spending the, you know, the weekdays in St. Louis and the weekends in Houston. Um, so I was actually the marketing director for both parks um, at the time. Uh, and I remember driving out going, you know, I, I won't, I've got to fly out to back out to St. Louis tomorrow. I'll never step foot on this park property ever again. And uh, so it was sad in that way, but I was extremely proud of, of just, the park team at the time and and the way that we did it and how we handled it uh we all i think all feel pretty good about you know how we we treated such a treasure uh, of a theme park and saying goodbye to it you know ron i got goosebumps when you talked about calling it 10 7 I, I you know for the <laughs> last time i really did um and i've never been there you know as a, as a guest or never yeah. been on that property but um and you mentioned earlier and i think josh and i can can absolutely identify with this you know, how the bug, the, the attractions industry bug, you know, kind of took hold of you. And then you talk about, you know, the, the feelings that you had for this piece of property, whereas, you know, an outsider might look at it and like it's, it's wood, it's steel, it's buildings, it's, you know, it's real estate, right? What is it that do you think connects people so deeply to these properties and to these entities that it is something literally that gets in your blood and you, you, you can't get it out? Like what, what, what do you think that is? Are you talking about people who work in the industry or people who are guests or both or? Primarily people who work in the industry. Yeah. Um, I, I really, I think, um, I, I think <laughs> that's a really great question. I, I think probably it is because of, of who you work with. It's, it's the people. I mean, I, my wife is a CPA. Uh, you know, she sits in front of a computer screen and, and does taxes and she's very, very good at it. She likes her job. She likes the people that she works with, but she has never fully understood the really odd and strange relationships all of us in this industry have with each other uh, because it is more than just um, a, a just having a work colleague. It's, you know, it's having people that become, because you spend so much time together, because you go into a day literally not knowing exactly what's going to happen, you know, and what challenges you're going to be presented with. And then if you're presented with challenges, you are arm in arm on trying to solve those and figure those out. Um, that you develop this sort of bond and this sort of relationship that goes beyond just being a, a mere work colleague. It, it, it really goes to being friends. And, and then ultimately, if you spend enough time, they become like, like family to you. Um, Cause you go through your professional experiences together. And because you're at work so much, you also live a lot of your personal challenges and life experiences together as well. So I think that really is it. If you talk to anybody who's left, uh, the industry or left the company, uh, I'm, regardless of what company it is, I think the first thing they would tell you is that I really, really miss the people. I miss the people who have the same strange addiction to this theme park craziness that I have because they really, truly understand me and nobody else does. But, you know, even dating back to the early Fiesta Texas days before it became a Six Flags Park, there's some bonds created there that, and even a park in, in, in its infancy as we were all trying to figure out what this park could become and be, um, we there were some strong bonds created then as well because we're all new to this, this theme park experience and in a brand new park trying to figure out, okay, what is the identity of this park that those those bonds are created pr pretty quickly as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the uh, yeah the relationships you build, it, no matter what, but also particularly when when the park is new, when you're opening the park, then it's it's all, very unique challenges that uh, that that y'all get um, together. I've the um, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have been able to be a part of a, a few opening teams of a few different right. parks, uh, and one closing as well. So I, I worked for Hard Rock Park back in uh, back in 2000 oh, yeah. actually. So I, I know both sides of it there. Yeah. Um, so then to to actually look at the other side of the coin there, um, the the guest connection to the park as well. 
And even uh, kind of looking at the story that you told of Grease Lightning at Astral World, that you yeah. built up the confidence because you you had something to to pursue at at the other end of it, the the, the girl's phone number, even though you didn't end up getting it. But that uh, I, I'm guessing that that ultimately did not matter because now you had this this no. new this new confidence, this new you know courage built up to be able to do something that you know was was uh was scary the optics of it are are scary they're terrifying that's kind of what our what our industry does and then it's almost like like a huge accomplishment that people that people uh that people get you know i I think of like when i was a kid and going like with the with a school group um you know to the parks everyone's talking about what they're going to do and on the you know the bus ride home everyone's you know swapping stories of, of what they did these major accomplishments so curious as far as your perspective on the guests connection to the industry and uh and being able to and you you shared those examples before in that in that family reunion but i would say like the the importance of the industry to the guest as well yeah well just to go back on the grease lightning story had had there been a chicken exit um on grease lightning like there is on uh on texas giant i I probably would have taken it so I, I don't give me too much credit for being courageous. There was no way out at that point. So, but you're right. I, you know, it did, it did build into me. Okay. You know, this is really cool and thrilling and fun and exciting. Um, and so I, I, that developed my love for it. You know, it, I think it's, it's fun to watch a family with bring in a child who has just hit that 48 inch mark because it's aspirational, right? I mean, they, they probably have been bringing this, this child to the park for a while and, and, you know, my other older brothers and sisters are riding these rides and they have to kind of sit on the sidelines and they hit that mark and they're so excited to tell you about that when they come to the park. And then by golly, watch them come off a coaster after they've ridden their first coaster, which they probably will go, you know, I, well, I can't believe I really want to do that. That was awful. Or no, more, more often, I really love that. Let's do another one. And that's, I think those firsts, um, the aspirational aspects of it um, are generational. And I think that and then when they grow older, they bring their kids to the park and their kids are bringing their kids to the park. And, you know, they'll talk about the experiences they had. So I think aspirational, generational, um, those are all things that I think keep our, our business thriving and keep people excited about continuing to come to the, the parks as long as we stay true to the guest experience and make sure, as you pointed out, Blim, the really, you know, historical, uh, relevant legacy items in with the new innovation. So that's the dance you have to play. But I love seeing that. I love seeing those kids who are thrilled to tell you they're finally tall enough to ride. Or, you know, even when they they don't, they say next year, we'll, we'll be there next year, you know. So they're already thinking about their visit next season when they might have grown a couple of inches and they can hit that that height mark or that height restriction for the ride they're getting ready to ride. Ron, it's so funny when you talked about the chicken exit um, or lack thereof on on that particular ride. Um, I have a similar story. My very first coaster ride was because the, the girl I was dating at the time said, come wait in line with me. And this was for Scorpion at Bush Gardens. And I was deathly afraid of roller coasters. And I'm like, all right, I'll be a good boyfriend. And I was like, there's gotta be a way out when you get up there. Nope, <laughs> nope you're getting on. And you know, of course, she's no longer with me, but I'm still in, in the industry. So, um, <laughs> but I, she, I she has no idea the impact that she made that. on your life. No. <laughs> What was that, Ron? <laughs> she tricked you. That was a total trick. Exactly. Yeah. A total trick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but my, my question goes back to something you said earlier about your children working at the park. So mm-hmm. what was that like to have them working at the park? And, you know, was their experience as magical as yours in, in the early days? Yeah, I think, I don't know if I would, I would call it magical necessarily <laughs> because they, you know, they, they work very hard. But um, so my oldest son, I, they all started when they were 15. And the reason why they started it, we hired in St. Louis at 15 and mom and dad said, you got to get a job. <laughs> so I said, I probably could, I, I might know some people, I might pull some strings and get you a job <laughs> at the park. So my oldest son started in admissions, uh, worked for a year in guest relations, decided that was a horrible decision, went back to admissions and season pass. Um, Josh uh, worked in rides. So Josh actually ran uh, Screaming Eagle in St. Louis and, uh, and a Ninja. Uh, and then my daughter worked in retail. Um, she worked in retail all through high school and most of college. And then when we moved to San Antonio, she worked in cash control. So they all had kind of different experiences. And I think they, they love the business. They, and, you know, again, they'll talk about the people that they worked side by side with. My daughter's, you know, actually all three of my kids ended up as supervisors. My daughter's a great story because 
she jumped into retail and she was a supervisor at 16. Imagine that, you know, a 16 year old kid managing people and getting the, that skill set, that leadership skill set. And, you know, she would, occasionally she'd come home frustrated. Can you believe what this, you know, person did today? Uh huh. Now you know. Now you know what it's like to be a parent. <laughs> So, um, but they, I know they will all tell you, in fact, we just all got together for Christmas and we spent about an hour sharing, you know, our theme park, Six Flags stories. Uh, you know, there's always, every one of us has one of those. My daughter has one where she was uh, during holiday in the park, uh, trying to get hot chocolate uh, from one location to the other and ended up tripping and falling and spilling the hot chocolate all over herself and all over uh, the back area. She said, I just sat there and, and, and bawled my eyes out for about 10 minutes because they were screaming, where's the hot chocolate, Emily? Where's the hot chocolate? She goes, but you know what, dad? I, after 10 minutes, I realized, okay, I got to fix this and I got to go get that store hot chocolate. So I just went back to where I made it and I covered in hot chocolate. I delivered the hot chocolate to the store. And, and that's a 17 year old kid who had a, you know, a, a bump in the road, uh, you know, an issue and even though it, it affected her, she calmed herself and she got herself right. And she ended up, you know, being able to overcome. And that's, I think that's what this industry teaches a lot of our young men and women is that it's not going to always be rosy. It's not always going to be fun. It's going to be hot. It's going to be cold. You're going to get rained on. Uh, and over being able to overcome those sorts of challenges that you have in a, you know, in a very busy operating environment, I just think it makes them stronger and better leaders down the line. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's really interesting. Um, so actually, were were you able to kind of guide her or mentor her as also you know a, a leader in the park as well, and that she was a supervisor at 16, 17 years old of being able to to kind of be a sounding board or, or someone you know, to say like I'm I'm here to to help you also develop through this journey as well. I tried to stay out of the way mostly. Uh, I want I really wanted you know our philosophy with our kids was to kind of let them find their own way, but certainly would be would be there if she had a challenge or a question about why something was being done or, or how to approach a certain situation. Our kids were always really good about bringing those things to us if they needed us, but also figuring it out on their own if they could. So uh, I, we, have, we did have lots of talks around the dinner table, especially when all three and myself were working at, at Six Flags uh, in St. Louis that my wife would have to say, okay, stop. <laughs> Let's talk about Let's talk about something else uh, other than let's not bring work home every night because now it's just it's all three of you now <laughs> or all four of you now. Yeah. So and we did actually get my wife out there for one event. We had a big catering in St. Louis and we needed extra help. So I said, hey, you want, let's make this let's check off this bucket list. Let's have all five of us go into Six Flags St. Louis and work for one day. So we've got a picture of, of her in her Six Flags uniform, too, so she could say she was in the family business. <laughs> <laughs> was that your bucket list or her bucket list? I think it was mine. I don't think she did. <laughs> but, you know, we were all working, so it was a way for her to be able to see us and spend time with us, too. So, Yeah. You know, Ron, a minute ago, you were talking about some of the lessons that your, your daughter took away from, from being in a, in, a, in a supervisory role. And that's one thing that I think young folks may not realize the skills that they are building that's going to help them later on in life. So what are some of those other skills that you've seen people build, whether it's in a, in a leadership role or even, you know, working in, a, in any kind of role at, at, the, at a theme park that really help them out later on in life? I think, first of all, first and foremost, and I said this earlier, communication, learning how to communicate, um, how, how to manage camp conflict, uh, whether it's with a, a team member or a guest. Uh, my son could tell you some great, you know, stories about his year in guest relations. And this is a young kid who, you know, had adult guests very upset with something that might have happened in the park and him trying to you know, talk them through what the solutions and, and options are. I think discipline, you know, being able to follow a schedule and and the, the challenge of that sometimes for our, our, our kids were very active in high school, you know, whether it was music or choir. So they had to manage their academic life around their work life. Uh, that's that's a skill. I mean, that's a skill and, and it, it helps you figure out how to prioritize as well, like what the things you need to be focused on. So and there's so many things. Uh, money management also, you know, whether it's you know, managing their paychecks or supervisor has a certain amount of money for an employee relations event, you know, you put this together. And so there's just, you name it, there's not a skill that we all use in our adult lives that you don't and can't hone and improve upon by working in the theme park environment. And I'm sure that you can say that 
about other industries, but it's all there in the theme park. Like it's, they're not hard to find. Yeah. Uh, just look for one and you'll, you'll find it. So with all of these skills uh, that are, are critical and, and that one definitely does develop when, when working in a theme park, what advice would you give to perhaps young professionals or aspiring leaders in the industry, somebody who maybe wants to be park president one day or to really just build a, a meaningful career in the industry? I would say, I know first and foremost, uh, don't be afraid to roll up your sleeves, get in the park, um, interact with guests, interact with team members, really truly understand uh, what's going on in the park, where the priorities should be, what the important, important things are. Um, you know, I think a lot of people look at executive roles in any business as being those sort of soft skill types of positions and in, in, in our industry, it's not. You really do, I think, need to be physically be in the park, be present so that you can truly understand what it is that needs to be done and you can learn. You can learn a lot of things just by walking on the midways um, on a busy operating day. So that's that really is it. And, and just, you know, being persistent and, you know, being, uh, being willing to maybe move and relocate and experience other parks. The relocation for me, um, I never thought I would ever live outside of San Antonio or Texas. But I will tell you that one of the most important things that I did, and I would believe me, I wasn't smart enough to plan this, was being willing to raise my hand and say, yeah, I'll move. I'll go experience this park. I'll go spend five, six years at this park because, you know, again, even though we're one, we were one brand, every park has its own unique identity and how it operates and what it does. And if you spend your entire career at one location, uh, you may be missing out on the opportunity to learn different perspectives uh, and different ways and approaches of doing things. So if you, if you can, especially young in your, your leadership career, young in your theme park career, um, if it's possible, I would definitely recommend getting a, a lot of different kinds of experiences in the industry so you can kind of package all those up. Uh, I learned you know, in the park president role, I, I leaned on things I learned in St. Louis, I leaned on things that I learned in San Antonio, in Houston, so it wasn't just coming from one perspective. I sort of picked up on the variety of those experiences. So, Ron, I want to switch gears just for a second and, and reference something you mentioned uh, earlier, which is a, a supposedly a San Antonio <laughs> delicacy, which is corn in a cup, which yes. you said many years ago when I was visiting San Antonio, you said you got to have corn in a cup and puffy tacos. Puffy tacos, I'm, I'm good with. Corn in a cup? Like, can you first explain all, what that I, is? First I of all? don't think you remember that conversation because <laughs> I cannot stand corn in a cup. <laughs> the puffy tacos, yes, those are by far the best thing ever made. And <laughs> you can really only get a good puffy taco in San Antonio. Um, but corn in a cup, I think actually the, the technical name for it is elote. Mm. And it is essentially what, as you described, it is corn in a cup mixed with a variety of things that you want it mixed with. And now I, in full transparency, I only like corn one of two ways, uh, corn on the cob or popcorn. So I'm not okay. a big fan of corn to begin with, but Matt, I, you and I are in complete and total agreement that um, it was way down on the bottom of my list <laughs> to tell you to try. I'm sorry if you felt like I suckered you into that, but uh, there are people who love it and you know people who can't get enough of it. So um, I think people just have different tastes, but I, I'm with you. I'm yeah. with you on the corn in the cup. We're, we're in the same camp on that one. Well, it's a story I now get to tell forever. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, well for sure. what it's worth, I have a few restaurants near me. I'm in Chicago, so I'm not in San Antonio. Yeah. They do have a lotus on their on their appetizer menu. And personally, I, I have yet to have a bad one. But uh, so okay. when, when Matt described it to me earlier before we recorded, I was like, oh, it sounds like a lotus. And, and I like that. It doesn't sound so bad. Yeah. But uh I, I guess I guess to each their own. It's an yeah. acquired taste. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, so Ron, as we start to, um, we're starting to get it a little close to the, the finish line here, but we still have a few minutes left. I, looking back, uh, what do you see as being one of the most fulfilling or uh, greatest moments or success that you've had uh, in your career? Wow. Um, I, that's like asking you to pick your favorite child. Um, <laughs> we all have, we all have one, but we'll never admit it. No, I'm joking. I don't know. Um, you can give a few <laughs> brief examples. if we. <laughs> I would say, you know, just uh, professionally in my career are, um, you know, obviously having the privilege of being the park president here at Six Flags Ever Texas uh, it was indeed a, a privilege that I will never, ever forget. And will always appreciate the opportunity to have served in that role, especially in the 60th anniversary of the park. So, but I'll, I'll tell you about an event um, 
that I, I did in St. Louis that still somewhat I smile about and haunts me. We were <laughs> we were actually uh, building a new roller coaster in St. Louis, a new GCI, um, and we uh, decided we were the we were really big into branding coaster experiences at that time. It was 2008, and um, we uh, we decided that we were going to call it Evil Knievel, um, and which thrilled me because growing up as a kid in the 70s, Evil Knievel was a hero to me. Uh, I watched all his jumps. Um, I cried like a baby when his Snake River Canyon rocket didn't deploy properly. So I was very excited about the opportunity to to call this right Evil Knievel because I knew that we were going to have the opportunity to work with him. Uh, sadly, shortly after announcing that, Evil passed away. And, you know, we were left with the challenge of trying to figure out how to properly, you know, pay homage to Evil uh, and his accomplishments without Evil being able to, to be present with us. And so we decided um, that we were going to reach out to his son, Robbie Knievel. And we came up with this really, it, it seemed like a really good idea at the time, <laughs> um, but it, it actually turned out to be really cool. We decided that Robbie was in, in honor of his dad he was trying to replicate all of his dad's significant jumps on his motorcycle. And uh, he decided that he was gonna jump 26 Dodge Chargers in our parking lot to help us open the ride. Now, you know, I, I, I at that, that point in my career, I think I'd been a marketing director maybe four years, five years, and I knew a lot, but I did not know how to pull off a, 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 a guy jumping 26 cars in our parking lot. Um, so I learned a lot. and. We, we ended up ended up having to spend about two weeks with Robbie. And the blessing there for me was that because I didn't get a chance to meet Evil, but in talking with Robbie, I got a chance to really learn all about his dad and, uh, and what it was like growing up to be the son of the greatest daredevil. Uh, and so much so that I developed a relationship with him um, that in the morning of the jump, it was thunderstorming and raining as it does in spring in St. Louis. And I thought, there's no way we're going to do this. Like, there's just no way we can pull this thing off. The weather's terrible. You know, it's not safe. And, and I called Robbie and I said, so what do you think? And he goes, I'm going to do it. And so then I began, I became worried about him. Like, and I, I need you to do it, but I'm also really worried about you know, your safety here. But he ended up, he ended up pulling off the jump. It was beautiful. There's, you can find it on YouTube. Uh, Robbie Knievel jumps uh, cars at Six Flags St. Louis. But the really funny thing about that is that after after the jump was complete, um, I felt compelled to walk up to him and hug him, uh, but he was really not all that interested in hugging me. So there's this picture that came out in the paper of me trying to hug Robbie and Robbie pulling away from me that I got uh, teased about uh, for many, many years thereafter. But um, the reason why I tell that story is because this industry presents so many unbelievable opportunities to do things that you've never done before. I never in a million years when I went to college and studied marketing thought that I was going to pull off a, you know, an event where a, a daredevil jumps 26 cars in our parking lot with fire and smoke and gets national press. And um, so the fact that there was no template for that, we just, we made the event up. We, we created it, we executed it, we delivered it successfully. We accomplished all the, all the objectives from a PR and marketing standpoint that we wanted to accomplish. It's still one of my fondest memories of being in the business and being in that role. And, and it just helped me and reinforce how, how cool our jobs really are. That not only do you get a chance to do what we do every day for our guests, but occasionally you're given a chance to, to uh, create and deliver these amazing events that people will remember forever. That is so cool. That is so cool. That's, I, I can just picture that because I, I was a kid of, of Evil Knievel as well. You know, I wanted yeah. to, I, I, I watched all those, all those jumps and everything. So that well, was Matt, really I don't know cool. if you had the little spinny wind up toy, but um, we decided that we were going to send those out as premiums to the media. And I got my hands on a couple of them. And this was just when we were all started, starting to try to figure out how to use social media. So if you go out to YouTube and you, type in Evil Knievel Ride at Six Flags St. Louis, you might see some videos of me trying to become a YouTube sensation with those, <laughs> with the windy Evil Knievel uh, motorcycle thing. So that, don't judge, it was early <laughs> in my social media career. So, but, but that was fun. I mean, it's just, and that, you know, again, it speaks to, well, we got this really cool ride. It's gonna be themed after Evil Knievel. What can we do? I mean, you know, I think one of, one of the things that we, were, we might talk about or we're gonna talk about was the social media and digital media age. And, you know, is that challenging? And, and it is because trying to figure out what platforms are the right platforms or 
how frequent uh, to post or, or to do things is, is the challenge. But the, our parks are so loaded with content. And, we, and a lot of brands, they struggle with that. They create content, they invent content. They, they come up with, you know, try clever things just to try to be relevant. Uh, and you, all you have to do in a theme park is just walk out in the park and fire up your camera or your, or your phone and say, okay, you know, what am I gonna get today? I know I'm gonna see something here that's gonna be really cool and really work well in the social and, and digital marketing world that we live in. So sadly, the Evil Knievel thing was way early in the game and I was not very good at it, so. <laughs> no, that's, that's awesome. Uh, it's so cool to, uh, to hear that story. Thanks so much for sharing that. And we're starting to wind down here. Uh, if people wanted to uh, get a hold of you, uh, where, would you where would you send them? I, you know, just find me on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time there these days, just kind of reading what's going on in the industry and, you know, trying to stay on top of what's happening. So uh, just reach out to me on LinkedIn, shoot me a note, and I am happy to, to respond back to it. All right. Awesome, Ron. This was an amazing conversation. Great catching up. Uh, next time I get to see you, we're going to have some of those puffy tacos. We'll avoid the corn in the cup, uh, but we'll have some puffy tacos. Um, and for everybody out there watching and listening, just remember, we are all attraction pros. Thanks for listening to the Attraction Pros podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you can tune in when new episodes release. And even better, please leave us a review on iTunes. For more information, visit attractionpros.com.